Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to our Sunday celebration of the risen Christ. We start with the declaration that Christ is risen. There is a response after Christ is risen. Hallelujah. The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Okay. You got that? Yeah. Right. Christ is risen. Hallelujah. He, he is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. It is fitting that the heavens should rejoice and that the earth should be glad and that the whole of creation, both visible and vis invisible, should keep the feast. For Christ is risen. Amen. The everlasting joy. As Jesus came that first Easter morning among his frightened disciples and shared his peace with them, let's take this opportunity to share the peace of the Lord with one another this Easter day. Yeah. 
please be seated as we pray. <clears throat> Living God, we worship you today with joy in our hearts and thanksgiving on our lips. When the powers of evil had done their worst, crucifying your son and burying him in death, you raised him to life again, an act of power giving hope to the world. Lord Jesus, we rejoice that death could not keep you in its grip, that you were raised to life, alive forevermore. You greeted your friends, and now you stand among us in your risen power. Spirit of God, you are always giving life to the people of God, giving birth to the children of God. Remodel us, we pray, in the image of Jesus, Fill us with his love and enable us with his risen power that we might be faithful to his ways, used by you in the redeeming of your word. This we ask in his name. Amen.
notices. <laughs> um, just a few notices for this week. Just to say we are um, we'll be having our midweek fellowship on Wednesday here at 7.30. We finished our um, uh, course. We were looking at doing our Wisdom House course and that was for Sunday school. But I think it's the, probably the last two of our chat around the Bible. So that's here in the church, all welcome at 7.30 on Wednesday evening. Next Sunday morning, service is led by a minister. Um, there's no um, adult Sunday school. That won't recommence until the 23rd of April, so not next Sunday, the Sunday after we recommence our adult Sunday school at 10 o'clock. And thank you to everybody who um, prays at 9 o'clock. We have our prayer list. I think there are copies available at the back, a hard copy if you want to sort of pray through that at home. Uh, but thank you for all those who faithfully meet at nine o'clock and play through all the items on our prayer list. So uh, thank you so much for that. I hope that's all. I hope I haven't missed anything. Okay. Just a quick reminder, if any of you are around in East Sheen on any of these dates, East Sheen Baptist Church have a fantastic um, lot of uh, people who are very gifted musicians and they're giving concerts at, um, it's in the afternoon on a particular, I think it's on a Monday at four o'clock, afternoon tea concert, all the new classics with violin, piano and voice. I'll stick that on the board if there anyone is around in each year at four o'clock. I know I'm all as I live there. <laughs> so, uh, thank you. Thank you, Jane. Let's continue to sing of our risen Lord. Matthew's account. 
It's going to be up on the screen there. Let's read together. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see what they had to do. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and brought him to the tomb, rolled back the stone, and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then they go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into the alley. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly, Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. While the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, saying to them, You are to say, His disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep him out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. Christ our Lord is risen today. Hallelujah. Let us sing. <coughs>
Let us pray. And as we reflect, Lord, on the incredible events that first Easter day, help us to think about our own response to the news being proclaimed this day throughout the world that Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. Well, the temple guards had been sent with or by the permission of Pilate, the governor, to keep watch over the tomb and the body of the crucified Jesus that lay inside. And they were there because the religious authorities had taken seriously, evidently more seriously than Jesus' own disciples, his claim that he would rise again from the dead. Not, of course, that the chief priests and the Pharisees believed it. But if Jesus' body should be stolen, it would lend credibility to the deceiver's claim. And the problem that they hoped was now dead and buried would be worse than ever if people started to believe that Jesus, as he had said, had indeed come back to life. So the guard was posted with the added precaution, Matthew tells us, of putting a seal on the stone, thus securing the entrance to the tomb, so that if anyone should come and seek to tamper with the body, the stone, the seal, would be broken. But then, what happened next, no guard could possibly have been prepared for. No official seal deterred. For Matthew reports, there was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone, and sat on it. Now, this wasn't the restrained, unstated, angelic appearance we often read about in the scriptures. For his appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. No wonder the guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. In their cataleptic state, were the guards, I wonder, able to hear the angel announce to the women that Jesus had already risen, passing out, it must have been, through the stone of the tomb itself, leaving the seal unbroken until the angel himself had come to roll back the stone. Did the guards in their cataleptic state hear the angel invite these women to go and see the place where Jesus' body had been laid to inspect the now empty tomb? What exactly, I wonder, was in the report? that those guards took back to the chief priests. Well, surely they would have blurted out something about the earthquake that they had experienced. I mean, hadn't they felt something like that in Jerusalem itself? Surely they would have told of the terrifying angelic presence and the fact that he had opened up the tomb declaring it now empty to the women who had come to anoint Jesus' body that morning. Surely the guards' report would have included all of these things. 
But whatever it was the guards actually did report to the authorities of their own experience, theirs was to be a different story. A different story. For having listened to the guards' report, the chief priests and the elders concocted for them a different account of events. And they did so for fear that rumours that Jesus had indeed risen from the dead would result in an even greater deception, as they called it, than the deception they had been battling against these past three years. So the truth was to be suppressed, replaced by some official spin intended to satisfy Pilate and anyone else who might hear of or show an interest in these strange and unsettling events. And just to make sure that the official version of events became the accepted version, for good measure, a bribe was given to the guards to keep their mouths shut. And an assurance given that the authorities would sort out any problems that might occur. And so it was these guards disappear from the story, taking with them their memories of this incredible spiritual encounter and the proof that they'd seen themselves and heard and the proclamation that had been made that Jesus had risen. And I wonder to what extent there might be some similarity between these guards' experience and the experience of some people today, men and women who aren't Christians, yet who have heard of, perhaps even experienced in some way, something about something of the risen Jesus Christ. In one way or another, they've heard reports that Jesus is indeed alive. Perhaps they've seen a balanced documentary about the Easter events on television. Perhaps their spirit has been stirred by one of those Hollywood epics that are on at this time of year. Perhaps it's something that they read in an Easter edition of a newspaper or a magazine. Or could it be that they've actually read some of the Christian literature that's been put through their letterbox? Or indeed, that they've actually attended an Easter service at a local church. But somehow, some way, their interest has been aroused. And they want to know more about the things they've read, the things they've heard, perhaps even that which they themselves have experienced. So, what to do with the evidence that one way or another has been laid before them. That the tomb was empty, and neither the bodily <coughs> remains of Jesus, of course, which there were none, or the place where Jesus was buried ever became revered by his followers as some kind of shrine. That Jesus' enemies could not produce his body, and so prove talk of any resurrection to be a deception. What to make of the psychological improbability that Jesus' disciples could possibly have continued to follow a dead rabbi, let alone to worship him? How to make sense of the many attested encounters with the risen Jesus, which surely could not be explained away as multiple cases of mass hallucination. How to find out more, where to take their questions, where to find the answers. Well, the answer might seem obvious. 
They can take their questions to the church. They can join a Christian fellowship to get answers. And some, of course, do. Especially if the local church is running something like an Alpha course or a Christianity Explored course. But the truth is that for many people, stepping inside a church is too big a step. And if inquirers are wary of taking the church route, then what other options are there open to them? Well, for some, of course, any interest, any questions will, over a period of time, simply die. Interests, other interests, other concerns will take their place. But for yet others, like the men who were guarding the tomb of Jesus, in the absence of any other obvious option, they will turn with their inquiries to the authorities, to the authority, <coughs> to those that they believe to be a reasonable voice, those whose opinions they believe are worth listening to, respected experts and intellectuals, academics, even media savvy celebrities who may not be experts in the field of religion, let alone Christianity, but whose opinions are nonetheless influential. Men and women who, like the chief priests and elders some 2,000 years ago, will, unless they are themselves Christian, often suppress the facts and spin a different account of events, turning the Christian story into a different story, one more palpable for domestic consumption and less troublesome for the powers that be. I wonder how many men and women's interest and experience of Jesus Christ has been conveniently explained away by such authorities. How many may have had their own story, their own personal insights and experiences dismissed and replaced by something akin to a cultural spin? An understanding of Jesus that challenges no one, that deceives no one with any intelligence, that leaves him dead in the tomb and implies that any followers of him, like you, like me perhaps, are sadly deluded people. I wonder how many questioners, how many genuine inquirers even, have been fobbed off by those who have a vested interest in denying, even suppressing the truth concerning Jesus' resurrection. But if going to or attending an inquirer's church, an inquirer's course at a church, isn't seen as an option, what other option does any sincere inquirer have? Where, if not in the secular realm out there in the world, can his or her questions be answered? His or her experiences shared? The answer may not seem obvious, but actually it's very obvious. Because the answer is you and me. And everyone who is a follower of the risen Lord Jesus Christ. You see, too often Christians can take literally the instruction given to the women that first Easter day and restrict their telling of the good news simply to other believers. As if we have formed something like a secret society and must keep the secret of Jesus to ourselves. Too often Christians can keep the good news of Jesus 
locked away in their buildings and gatherings, as if like the disciples that first Easter day, they are not in fear of the Jews, but in fear of the world and what the world might think of them and do to them. And yet if Jesus has been raised, and if he has won for us forgiveness and reconciliation with God, if he is the first fruits of God's promised new creation, and if he has gone to prepare a place for us in that new creation, then haven't we got the best possible good news there could ever be, and the most wonderful of hopes that we can share. Now, if that's what we truly believe, if that's what we truly believe, then shouldn't family and friends and work colleagues and fellow students and neighbours the people that we live with, the people that we study with, the people that we hang out, shouldn't these people know that we are followers of Jesus Christ, that we are Christians? And shouldn't the integrity of our Christian lives, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, encourage them to come to us and speak freely to us, bringing to us their questions, sharing with us their experiences. Open and accessible. Each and every Christian should be the natural go-to option for those among whom we live and live out our lives being always, as Scripture puts it, prepared to give an account to everyone who asks us to give the reason for the hope we have, and doing so with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, always prepared to share with others the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ and what he has done for us, what he has done for me. The resurrection of Jesus Christ was an event with the profoundest implications for the world God loves and for each and every one of us. It's a truth that is far, far too important to leave to non-Christians to explain away. It's a truth, indeed, too dangerous for many to accept. But truth it is. A truth Jesus has entrusted to each one of his followers to share, to speak out, to live out. A truth that we confine to our fellowships and conceal within our churches to our own and to others' great cost as well as to the grief of the one who has given us this good news to share with the world. The guards had no other option but to take their experience and to take their questions to those who could not and would not tell them the truth, whereas inquirers today should feel free to come to you and come to me. But to do so, they will, of course, need to know not only who we are, but what we are. And we ourselves will need not only to know the truth, but the privilege and the honour that it is ours to share. To share the good news of Jesus Christ. To share news of our risen Saviour. To ensure that as best as is possible, we, unlike the guards that first Easter day, don't allow others who would inquire about this wonderful event to disappear out of God's salvation story, 
taking with them only the memories of what might have been. Risen Lord, may our lives be lives that proclaim your resurrection. May there be nothing in them that could be a barrier, an obstacle to the faith of another. May we be the means by which others come to know the truth about you. And may we be ready for each and every opportunity that comes to us to help others to know you. For the honour of your name we pray, and for the building of your kingdom, even through us. Amen. We come to the Lord's table now to celebrate the Lord who gave his life for us. And if you are a Christian of any denomination, please feel free to share with us. Matthew records that when evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve. While they were eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you the truth. I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Let us pray. Thank you, dear Lord, once again for all that you have done for us. Thank you that you are the God who holds nothing back in order to win for us forgiveness, acceptance, reconciliation and the promise, Lord, that through your Spirit at work in us we will indeed one way, one day be all that you created us to be. Thank you, Lord, for that promise, and thank you, Lord, that as we share this bread and the wine, we see that you have sealed your promises to us with your blood. May this partaking be a blessing, Lord, I pray and speak to each one of us as only you can. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please take and eat the bread as it is served and we retain the cup and we drink in fellowship together.
He is not here, he has risen, just as he said. Lord God and Heavenly Father, we give thanks for these words of the angel to the women who journeyed to the tomb of our Lord Jesus that first Easter Sunday morning. Thank you that through his death and resurrection, the Lord gained the victory over sin, death and hell, and that all his people shared in that victory. Thank you that we are reconciled to you and saved through the death and resurrection of Christ. We pray that all your people around the world this day, no matter how harsh their suffering or the persecution they face, will be able to rejoice in his resurrection power. For we ask in the name of our risen Saviour. In a moment of quiet, let's bring our own personal prayers for ourselves and those whom we know and love to the Lord. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. So we come to our closing hymn. Please do say and partake of refreshments, <coughs> uh, sumptuous refreshments, I'm sure, for the service. Um, we join together singing, Thine be the glory, risen, conquering sun. Thank you. 